Cool. Yeah. Cool. Bye, guys. Uh, so my talk is going to be about threat hunting for dummies, right? Uh, I'm a big old dummy. It's kind of the point of this. Um, the intent of the talk right now is to not go over something that's incredibly technical or to explain to you how to threat hunt, to tell you what it is, uh, why you want to do it, and then all the mistakes that I've made in the process of uh, going through all of it, right? Um, so this is who I am. Uh, so I'm lead threat hunter at Global Payments. It is a uh, payments processing company uh, that's part of uh, basically a big conglomerate <laughs> uh, of payment companies. Uh, I've got about eight years of uh, experience in security analysis. Um, it ranges from uh, healthcare sector, DOD, uh, finance, hedge funds, payment systems, uh, all of the above. Uh, I'm a husband first, a hacker second, and an internet introvert. Um, this is probably the only time you're ever going to see me in person uh, is when I do speaking engagements. I am not online. Uh, I don't have a social media presence. Um, and to kind of rip off of the prior talk here, uh, missing person, CTF judge and contestant. So the Australian cyber unit uh, puts on a uh, year, yearly hackathon uh, that a judge, if anyone is interested in that, please come find me afterwards and help you out with that. Um, yeah. uh, again, agenda. Uh, so what is threat hunting? Uh, why would you threat hunt uh, pitfalls and mistakes? And then we're going to go over uh, this question. Uh, we start with a quote uh, from one of my favorite books, uh, Cliff Stoll, uh, very, very wonderful person, uh, probably one of the first threat hunters is what I would say. Uh, but it's really important here, and uh, it's, a, it's kind of a key point of the talk here, is, is that um, it's not about being intelligent with computers or being literate with computers. It's about uh, just being literate in general, right? Uh, the perspectives of uh, everyone uh, in the space, uh, in security, uh, where you come from, the diverse backgrounds and the perspectives that you bring to uh, threat hunting or uh, analysis in particular are incredibly important. Um, and those different perspectives can kind of play into uh, how you kind of approach things, right? Um, in particular, uh, in a couple of examples of that, right? Um, I think a communications major would probably have a better uh, idea or uh, route to detect social engineering attacks, right? Hey, you communicate with people all, all day, every day, probably understand how to manipulate that. Um, another example of something like that would be, hey, your, your DBA, your database administrator, um, that person is probably going to know where all your sensitive, sensitive data is stored. Um, it's going to know what type of attack vectors or, or how those things would be uh, attacked. Um, I think this is incredibly important. Uh, again, uh, the name of the talk, they're hunting for dummies. Uh, you, could be, you could be dumb and still know how to do security. Um, Obligatory meme, right? Uh, what if I told you threat hunting is just uh, incident response without the incident, right? Uh, those skill sets, right? Uh, SOC analyst, uh, a threat hunter, uh, an IR analyst, uh, we are all part of the, of the same team, right? We all have a very similar skill set. Um, and it, it's incredibly important to not uh, pigeonhole yourself, right? Just because I'm a threat hunter or a SOC analyst or uh, a database administrator or someone who's doing some sort of other technical pursuit it does not mean that you cannot uh, threat hunt or go look for bad guys, right? Um, it's incredibly important to um, keep that in mind when you're uh, thinking about these things. Uh, so we'll start off, uh, what is threat hunting? Uh, these are the three core tenets, right? Or at least this is an opinion type thing, right? Uh, everyone's kind of got a different definition of what threat hunting is. Um, there's the book definition, right? It's a proactive and iterative approach to uh, validating whether or not a host is compromised, right? Uh, going out there, grabbing uh, information coming from a host, uh, checking whether or not bad things have happened, uh, whether that's indicators of compromise, hashes, domains, IP addresses, whether or not they're present on a system, or its behaviors, right? So TTPs. Um, again, uh, so that's that. Uh, proactive versus reactive. Uh, the kind of difference between that right there is going to be uh, incident response. So instead of responding to an alert, or uh, an automated function of a security tool that you've already deployed, uh, that you may have been maintaining, it's uh, proactive, right? You're going out and actively searching out the bad guys. And the reason that's important in particular uh, versus the reactive approach to security is that uh, security technology has not been updated or uh, has not advanced as fast as the attacker. Um, the signature, signature technologies in particular have been uh, almost identical for years and years and years, right? Everyone knows what regex is. Uh, you can apply a pattern to something and match something. Um, but what happens if I add a zero to the end of my payload, right? A human is going to be able to uh, see those things, 
um, before a tool would. Um, that kind of goes to the next uh, the next point there. Human German and tool oriented. Uh, it's really important to empower your people to go look for bad things instead of uh, using your tools and using your people to make your tools better. Uh, the opposite approach of taking uh, your people and using the tools to augment your people has been, uh, in my opinion and in my experience, uh, the best route to actually finding bad in the network. Uh, just because I have alerts firing, um, if anyone's ever done security analysis, you probably are well aware of the alert fatigue uh, that kind of occurs, right? Uh, this process in particular, you're able to avoid that. Um, and then uh, the third tenant here, right? Uh, validation of compromise. Uh, that's kind of the end goal. Um, this doesn't always occur, right? Uh, just because I went and looked for bad does not mean that I found bad. Um, and there are a lot of other attributes uh, and, and value that kind of comes out of doing threat hunting other than this validation of compromise. But if you were going to sell this to someone, right? Uh, hey, uh, is my host popped? Is my network owned? Uh, that's kind of the point. Uh, this is a really dumbed down uh, process. Uh, there's a lot more intricacies kind of involved with the threat hunting process. Um, you start with hypothesis, right? Uh, scientific method. You don't always have to start with the hypothesis, uh, but still, uh, it's incredibly important to have one, right? Hey, why am I going to look, right? Uh, what am I going to go look for? Are we looking for a behavior? Are we looking for something that is occurring? And, and why are we looking for, right? Having uh, an informed approach in creating your hypothesis and understanding, okay, hey, I have a gap in these detections in this location. Uh, these are the type of actors that would be targeting me. Um, this is how they would be targeting me. And, and creating a hypothesis surrounding that is the first step. Uh, the second step would be data collection, right? Uh, so uh, I'm gonna go look for this behavior. Uh, let's say it's, uh, we're gonna go look for a SQL injection on a database, right? Uh, one equals one attack, just to make it really basic and simple. Um, what logs do I need? Right, we got to answer that question first, and and these preparatory steps in the threat hunting process are the bread and butter. Right, uh, half of my job uh, is research. Um, hey, this new attack occurred. Um, this new TTP uh, to to rip off of some of the other talks that you guys may have heard while you've been here. Uh, Conti, right? Hey, they're gonna they're gonna delete backups. Maybe they're using VSS admin to delete um, things. Okay, well, hey, that's a behavior, or that's that's something that would occur. Um, taking that behavior and then extracting uh, or extrapolating the things that are surrounding that, right? Hey, they're going to delete backups. Why are they deleting backups? What would be the actions that would be taken before someone would be de deleting backups? Taking all that stuff, collecting the logs, understanding uh, where to go look is a big part of, uh, of the game, right? Um, the third step here, investigation, and I'm going to kind of glare over this. Uh, the, again, the intent of the talk is not to be incredibly technical here. Uh, I'm not going to teach you how to investigate anything here, uh, but I will give you a couple of methods. Um, a lot of what threat hunting is and ends up being is, is you end up with a very large data set at the start, or at the get, after you've done your data collection. Hey, I need to go look at all my database logs. Well, how do I navigate through said database logs to actually identify something? Uh, the vast majority of the time, it's going to be statistics, right? It's basic math. It's, it's okay, hey, what are my outliers? What is the standard deviation between... Uh, uh, how long this session is connected. Okay, well, what are the outliers? Um, how can I group things together in order to differentiate between different groups of data to determine, okay, hey, this group of data uh, would be susceptible to, to, to attacks because it has this selection of vulnerabilities or X, Y, Z. Um, and then the last piece here uh, would be outputs. Uh, outputs are kind of self-explanatory. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit of detail uh, in, in subsequent slides. Um, and then the last thing to say about this really simplified process here is, is that uh, every single point of this, it, it's not cyclical in the sense of like, hey, it's going to go around a circle, but each point in the process can go back and forth, right? Uh, you get to your data collection, you realize, hey, I don't have these logs, and everyone's going to end up in that scenario uh, a lot of the time, um, especially if you're not aggregating all your logs. Um, what can I do with what I have? Um, I think that's where we need to start. Um, what can I do with what I have? And then um, not only what can I do with what I have, but what about the people that I have? It doesn't, again, it doesn't need to be a threat hunter. It doesn't need to be a security analyst. It doesn't need to be an IR responder in order to go look for these things. Um, so again, um, slide. Um, what is important to threat hunting? Uh, these are five points. Uh, They're not related to each other, but these are what I think is important to threat hunting. Um, an intelligence-driven approach, right? Um, if you are not informed about uh, who, what, where, and when is going to be targeting you, uh, how do I know what to go look for, 
right? Um, you don't. <laughs> it's kind of the simple answer to that. Um, my Intel guy would be really happy that I put this on the slide. Um, he, he harps on me all the time. I get that not everyone has a dedicated Intel person, uh, but it's as basic as, uh, hey, I have these detections in place. Where are my gaps? Um, and then targeting those gaps with your hunts based off the behaviors. Um, adversarial mindset, um, I may be a blue guy, but I am also a hacker, right? I, I bleed red. Um, but having that mindset of, okay, hey, how would I do this? How would I break the thing? And understanding how you would break the thing can allow you to kind of uh, take that mentality. Of, okay, hey, I'm going to go to use this hole. This is where I would target. So why don't I go look for the bad thing there? Um, third thing here, um, we're going to talk about characteristics of an analyst. Uh, this is very, very opinion-based. Um, call these the four C's and the three F's. Um, the three F's being fail fast, fail hard, fail often. Um, failure is incredibly important when doing these things. You're going to fail. You're going to make mistakes. And especially in threat hunting, it's a little bit different in, as far as the criticality of your mistakes, right? We're not talking about, hey, I need to block this IP to sinkhole a domain to get rid of a malware infection. Uh, it's not that critical. Um, you're going to fail. You're going to go look for things and not identify anything in the process of going to look for those things. That does not mean that it doesn't have value, not only from the perspective of uh, building your own internal uh, monologue and your own experience, but from the perspective of you can identify things in a network where, hey, I have a batch of 2012 R2 servers. Why are they there? Well, I wouldn't have known that if I wouldn't have gone and looked, right? Um, so that's those are the three Fs. Uh, the four Cs, uh, curiosity, first and foremost. Uh, I think curiosity is incredibly important. Uh, being able to communicate and being able to communicate effectively uh, to people who don't understand what you're talking about. And then, um, uh, I actually forgot the other two, I'm gonna be honest, a little bit nervous up here. <laughs> um, number four here, uh, TTPs versus IOCs. And this is also another thing that I like to harp on to my new guys is that uh, indicators of compromise and searching for indicators of compromise is not threat hunting. Uh, just because you can go Google or uh, go chuck uh, an IP in a SIEM system and then get hits, that does not mean that you are hunting. Um, it's incredibly important to center your hunts based off of behaviors. And the reason uh, that's the case is uh, IOCs are descriptive uh, and um, or TTPs are descriptive versus IOCs are more like a point in time type of deal. Uh, who's to say that they're still valuable or whether or not they're timely or anything of the above. Um, and centering your hunts around TTPs allows someone to um, take those behaviors. And again, uh, a singleton TP, TTP is going to allow you to kind of separate um, separate that out and then go search for a broader range of things. Um, and then again, outputs. Uh, I said we were going to talk about this in a little bit more detail. The outputs of a threat hunt. What is that? Uh, obviously, reports, right? Uh, re write reports on a constant basis. Um, uh, compromise assessments, uh, there's going to be mitigations, patches, detections, analytics. Uh, you, you can kind of name it, right? Anything and everything that can kind of come from uh, understanding what your data looks like and how someone would attack it would be an output. Um, what I would say there is that, again, to kind of harp on, uh, you don't find something. Um, those mitigations and being able to commu communicate those mitigations uh, to leadership in your organizations would be uh, the benefit, even if you don't find something. Uh, big old slide is from the Verizon Data Breach. Um, this kind of rips off of a couple of uh, other talks that have happened as well. 82% um, of organizations of the breach uh, involve the human element. Um, I think someone said in another talk as well is, is that uh, humans, uh, while they may be the biggest vector, they are not uh, the one to focus on. I think that's what was said. Right. Uh, but that but that attack surface is increasing, right? Uh, humans are always going to be there. That attack surface is always going to grow uh, as we have more humans, as we have uh, uh, more issues. And uh, what, what I think is important here on this slide in particular is that you can't patch a human, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, as far as uh, detections are concerned, um, it's easier for a human to detect a human than a uh, computer uh, can detect a human. And the reason being is, again, it goes back to those detection patterns. Uh, I've got a pattern. Uh, what happens if that gets manipulated, right? What happens if I encode it? What happens if I encrypt it? What happens if I add a zero to the end? A uh, human's going to be able to, uh, with their eyes, snap and know what that looks like because they've got experience seeing it before versus a computer trying to match a pattern. Uh, it, you may miss. Oh, so why are we threat hunting? So that's what threat hunting is. Uh, why should we threat hunt? Uh, it fills the security control gaps, right? Um, 
So in the case of those uh, security technologies that you would deploy, um, you can kind of fill those security control gaps. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a full fill, right, or a full fix. Uh, it's very much, uh, hey, I can, I can kind of uh, supplement and or uh, shore up a little bit of it by going, go, going to go look for those things. I think what's really important there is uh, not on an ad hoc basis. If you were going to go, uh, hey, I'm going to use threat hunting to fill a security control gap, um, it's incredibly important to um, uh, do that iteratively and repeat that thing um, in order to uh, pass the check. Uh, dwell time reduction, uh, I think this is kind of self-explanatory. A dwell time uh, is going to be how long an actor is inside of a network. Um, that uh, Being able to reduce the dwell time by going and threat hunting, um, yeah, uh, you should be able to find them faster. It's kind of the point there. Um, and the last but not least, uh, networks are unique and change. Uh, again, about the deployment of the security technologies. Just because you deploy sec security technologies does not mean that they are tuned, they are adequate to actually detect and uh, create the alerts that would be uh, high fidelity uh, that uh, kind of action. Um, and that changing of the network allows those payloads and uh, the intricacies and the sophistication of what you're going to look at. Um, it's going to be different. Uh, this is from Sophos. Uh, this is the dwell time by company mean size. Uh, the point of this slide here is that as uh, employee um, count increases, dwell time uh, decreases. Um, I don't think anyone believes that 19 days is going to be an acceptable amount of time for an actor to be inside of a network. So I don't think it really actually matters whether it's 19 or 52. Uh, but again, uh, just to kind of show you, um, I mean, especially in West Virginia, um, uh, security organizations don't have a bunch of security people, right? I think it's important to kind of note that here, especially for this audience. All right, uh, last why threat hunt slide. Uh, so it's people focused security solution again about investing in your people, about it being a human solution uh, versus a technology solution. Um, I think uh, again, human brain is probably the best detection engine that has ever been created. Um, all of those ideas kind of flow from us. Um, threats can look like legitimate activity. Uh, again, to riff off some of the talks that have been. Uh, uh, done here, uh, live off the land attacks, right? Hey, someone's going to use PowerShell um, in a way that PowerShell is used on a normal basis. Uh, maybe your uh, sysadmins are using PowerShell to um, automate something or uh, access something. Um, it's going to look like malicious behavior. So again, that that fidelity of your alerts um, and avoiding avoiding that in its entirety um, and looking for things in that, in that way. Uh, increase in attack sophistication. Again, to kind of uh, go back to Conti, and, and some of the other talks is that uh, increase in attack sophistication in, in, in Conti. You can see that these business or these uh, groups are being run like businesses. Uh, they've got dev teams. They've got uh, everything, everything that a regular business would have. Um, that's going to continue to happen. Um, and the last thing here, and I think I've said this a couple of times, humans are better at catching humans than computers. Uh, pitfalls and mistakes. This is the good type. Uh, this is the good stuff, right? Uh, I've messed up so many times in doing this. Um, I'm going to continue to mess up. Uh, I'm going to continue to make mistakes. Uh, but where do you start, right? Um, this is a lot of a lot of the time when I get new people in. Um, it's what what do I go what do I go look for, right? Uh, how do I go look for it? Um, where do I start? Um, there are a million different resources out there. Uh, I really wanted to avoid talking about MITRE in my talk, uh, but I'm going to bring it up here. Um, the, the MITRE framework, uh, don't use it as checklist is what I would say, but it definitely can give you the ability to, um, go out there and, uh, identify TTPs that would be applicable to your network, right? Uh, or if you've identified a threat actor or a group that would be targeting your sector, it will give you the breakout of TTPs. Um, so yeah, GitHub, MITRE, Google, any of the, any and all of the above, um, just start is what I would say. Uh, if you get started, um, have a good route to continue. Uh, the second bullet here, and this is kind of a, a opinion, <laughs> AI and ML is not a silver bullet. Uh, you can't deploy AI or ML in a network without a large or specific data set and actually expect it to do what you want it to do. Um, it does have a use, and it does have a use in a lot of places, but I think it's incredibly important that if you are going to use artificial intelligence or machine learning, they use it in a proper way, and you actually use it on a data set that's actually applicable. Um, a lot of people are not going to have uh, that amount of data to where it actually is useful. And the last uh, last one here, uh, ad hoc hunting, uh, and I think I talked about this already, is that um, just because you ran a hunt once does not mean that it's not going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> um, so revisiting the things that you've done in the past, uh, just because it's something that you've done in the past doesn't make it not interesting, doesn't mean that you're not going to find something different the next time you look. 
Um, and again, about it being a human process, that's uh, it's going to be something that we need to do. Um, I think this is the last slide here. Uh, and these are the last pitfalls and mistakes. Rabbit hole is a waste of time. Uh, when you've got your hypothesis, you go and look for something and you're looking through your data. A lot of the time, you're going to find something else. Uh, you're going to see a user agent that sticks out or you're going to see uh, an HTTP header that looks abnormal um, and it may not be uh, part of your um, hunt. But what's important here is, is that you separate uh, your hunts that way. Uh, log that in your report, go back and revisit it. Um, I've spent countless, countless, countless hours just tracking one little piece of information. Um, please avoid that if you can. Um, bias of all kinds, um, and especially when you're hunting um, uh, confirmation bias, uh, right? Only looking for information that is related to your hypothesis um, so you can confirm it. Uh, I would avoid that. Um, there are many other types of bias. We're not going to get into that here. Context via intelligence, uh, I think, is really important. Um, is your intelligence timely? Um, is it related to what you're doing? Um, is it related to the news cycle? Is an executive telling you, hey, I saw a news article, go look at this thing? Uh, again, context is king, um, and if uh, context isn't present, um, it's not worthwhile. Um, and then baseline fallacy, uh, this is the last but not least. A lot of people like to use these tools to go, okay, hey, this is a known good in my network, right? Uh, this is the status of my network. This is what it's supposed to look like. Um, what I think is important there is how do you know that you weren't compromised when you took your baseline? <laughs> um, and, and then not only that, but how do you know what no good is? Um, having having procedures and making sure that your gold images are actually gold <laughs> um, is incredibly important. And this is the last slide here. Um, and this is kind of the end. This is really the point of what I'm trying to say here is uh, a proactive approach to security analysis required to accurately detect and get ahead of attacks. Uh, the point here is to get ahead of it, right? Uh, to not respond to things. You want to actually fix the problem before it actually happens uh, and or catch it while it is happening. Um, and then uh, last but not least, uh, different perspectives and backgrounds are more likely to benefit your organization. Uh, just because someone doesn't have, a not, uh, doesn't have a traditional security background or doesn't come from a traditional security space does not mean that they don't have a value or a benefit, especially when it comes to proactive security. Um, again, uh, the different facets of humans and the different uh, perspectives that people bring to the table, um, especially in this space, uh, are incredibly important. I think that's it. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> Go for it. So, with me being small, yeah. and kind of a large entity, right. would you suggest that we ask the government to essentially look at their own stuff sometimes? Um, yeah. Yeah, um, and I think it, I think the only caveat there is is be cognizant of time, right? Not everyone can do it all the time. Uh, no one can. Not everyone can dedicate eight hours a day to going looking for bad. We've got regular job duties. Um, what I found success in is not only getting um, all of the stakeholders involved, whether it is a, a sysadmin or a database admin or your devs or whatever, whoever it may be, but asking the question is, uh, what are you worried about? <laughs> Where are your crown jewels? Uh, what is important to you? Uh, if if something were to go down, um, which one, which piece of that is most important? And then have them focus on that in particular, um, and then uh, vet out attacks that would be surrounding those things. Anyone else? Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really want to talk, man. <laughs> All right, that's it. Um, if anyone wants to get a hold of me, uh, here's my information. This talk was a part of our 2022 Secure West Virginia Lucky 13 Conference. If you would like more information about this talk or our speaker, check the description below. And if you enjoyed the content, consider liking and sharing this video. For more information on Secure West Virginia or you want to stay updated with the latest upcoming events, follow us on Twitter at SecureWVCon or visit our website SecureWV.org. We would li also like to thank our 2022 sponsors for being a huge part of Lucky 13's success.